I keep thinking of the cool hand work uh, road crew they had. What we have here is a failure to communicate. <laughs> Are you saying you sell the word and all that? Yeah. I would imagine they get a lot of requests. Mm -hmm. And it depends, you know, it's, it's volunteers. The prisoner gets uh, credit for two days if he works. Oh, wow. He gets, you know, better food a little bit. Yeah, usually the lunches are pretty well done. Well, both times we, whoever hires you has to provide yeah. oh, it's better than you know three hots of a cot kind of thing they did a great job picking up trash yeah. it wasn't that long after six and six years that they were picking up they had a big bag it is it was traffic gone down yeah but you still somewhere yeah. we, we missed a couple small ones and so they got those but there was did they get under the bridge? I know that's dangerous. Under, under Lancashire? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, they were working that way. I didn't see them down there per se, but they were working. I saw them at Kingsland. I saw them go all the way up the state line, turn around and come back the other side. And then I saw later, I saw orange, big orange bags for trash on the side. Yeah. 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 Mandatory. <laughs> the highway department could see them, pick them up. That was really them in their jumpsuits. They were hiding. Yeah. <laughs> they could be able to waiting for the pickup truck. Waiting for a pickup <laughs> <laughs> they had somebody the lined up to come to the road. 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 Yeah, Interesting way to escape. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Just some empty bags to <laughs> withstand, withstand that lift. We've seen crazy stuff. Even money sometimes. Yeah. It pays to clean up that stuff. Dollar bill is a rare five. Every single word with your family deal? Yes, thank you. What do who was hey. <laughs> One minute. Okay. Hey, you've moved to a two camera setup. I just noticed that. How you doing? So you can direct between can you cut back and forth on your yeah. Get rid of this. Did you get back I, thought I, I thought it was because you were bilingual. I thought it was because you were bilingual. Without one too. Spanish, one English. Exactly. Oh, okay. You're right. That too. Mm -hmm. Yeah, when I played racquetball, I played with both hands. I couldn't do backhand fast enough. I just switched hands. Yeah, they did. Didn't lose a thing. Wait, how do we look? You're good. Almost there. They're just changed. Okay, it's time. Ladies and gentlemen, we're going to begin. Alrighty, a call to order the City Council work session for the City of Bella Vista, Monday, April 18th. We'll just start from the top and go right through the agenda. The first is a resolution authorizing the Mayor and City Clerk to enter into a contract with Superior Automotive. This was for some police cars. You may remember that at the last minute, the Chief found out that the 2022s that he thought was going to be available are not and it's 2021 so we had to uh, table it so that uh, he would have an opportunity to uh, meet with Mr. Kelly as well as the vendor and find out are they 2021s if so do they or do we get a price break etc cetera, etc cetera. 
And so you'll see that pop up in the next one, and I'll move right to it, where it's an ordinance waiving the requirement of a formal competitive bid, and it's back to Superior for $87,027, the purchase of three 2021 vehicles. So I saw a chief here. Thank you, I think he's talking about one lady. I, I, I can right speak a little bit to him. Okay. If, if, if I need oh, there he is. No, he's back. It's your time for your car. I'm sorry. It's car time. Question. So we're at, at the new ordinance where you're having to go back to 2021s. And did we get a price break and et cetera, et cetera. So, so uh, I, I, I put, I don't know if it's in your packet, but I gave it to, to Jason as far as the pricing it's it's not necessarily a price break it's still a, it's still a government price it's not something that any citizen can get but uh, it's it's probably slightly above what the last bid waiver we had for those cars was but uh, it's it's very close so it's just a little over 29,000 yeah. for each car and just so and I think I spoke to a couple of council members for it even started we just can't get cars so our car guy, their car guys are making money. I, I don't blame them for that. They have to do that. But he's able to scrounge us up, you know, three 2020, 2021s um, and, and hold them for us because we had to do this bid waiver. Uh, and, and um, you know, I'm going to have to just continue to work with them in the future and get them at the price, the best price we can get them at, come to council, do bid waivers moving forward uh, because there's just, it's, it's really hard getting vehicles now and they're not doing a lot of uh, state bids on them. I have a question. Are, are these actually new, even though they're they are brand new? Yeah, they're brand new. I think they. I think even in the, yeah. in the packet there it says like ten miles yeah, or eleven miles. miles. Yeah, 10 10 miles. miles. So they are brand new. Yeah. Well, uh, the old bid was fifty-seven grand each, and this is twenty-nine grand. I'm sorry. Grand I'm sorry. Each. That was my mistake. I put fifty-seven as a number I use. It gets me a car and all the equipment. Yeah. Okay. okay. So, okay. so last time I put that in there, and I shouldn't have. I usually just try to get the approval yeah. for the cars from you, and then I have the equipment that I that I piece it. That's I the, thought that was too big a break. Yeah, yeah fully so loaded, it, it, yeah. fully loaded yeah. versus yeah. just the car. Yeah, yeah. the car is usually about 26, 27, 28, and the rest is the equipment. Yeah. Okay, I think Jerry has a question for you, Chief. Yes, sir. Uh, there's, there's four cars for 228,000, and yet there's three cars for 87. Yeah, so so um, that was just brought up. So the, the, the four cars for the 200 and change that was at 57 a piece because that's a car and the equipment okay uh, that was my mistake i usually just ask for the money for the car well the money's already there i usually ask for the approval to buy the car because it's over 10 grand obviously um, but usually the car is about 26 27 or 28 000 and the rest is the equipment to put in the car okay so you're what you're seeing now is three cars at 29 29 yeah. and change, uh, so it's 80 some thousand for three cars because that's just the car. Okay. So I guess we couldn't get four. He doesn't have that's four. Right he doesn't have four. Yeah. Even though the council's authorized me to buy four, I'm going to have to go back to him in my budget. I'm going to have to go back to him and say, okay, let's let's try to try to find me one more and then I'll come back to you for a bid waiver for one more or whatever we can find it at. Okay. Are there any questions? <clears throat> you know, I don't have a question. I just noticed I. I guess I missed it before because I'm sure it was in other packets. I didn't know Arkansas doesn't have like a cooling off no, they don't. deal. So when you buy it, it's yours no matter. Yeah. It's a lemon, huh? Mm -hmm. well, they got a lemon law. There's oh, a, they do. So they got a lemon law. That's just something else. Yeah. Okay. Arkansas has got a lemon law. Okay. I guess it, you no can't take it back just us. because you don't like it. Right. Okay. That's well, usually it. there's different laws the for consumers Pardon? versus the business color. anyway. Said, a lot of consumer protection laws don't apply to others. Thank you, Chief. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, we'll move on to the next. Is an ordinance waiving the requirement of formal competitive bidding and authorizing the purchase of corrugated metal drainage culverts based on price and availability by informal price quotes through calendar year 2022. This is for some work that uh, Superintendent Button wants to do on Highlands Boulevard. Um, I should mention to you that the state comes in and inspects bridges. And they consider culverts, does it have to be three or more? It's just any drainage conduit that spans over 20 foot. It's considered a bridge. It could be a box culvert, culverts. Right. So Mike keeps his eye on them, and then the state comes in, and usually Mike's already caught it, and he's got it lined up. Um, do you want to speak to this at all, Mike? Uh, if anybody's got any questions. He's giving you a breakout in 
and a, and a memorandum in your package? You talk about corrugated metal. Um, historically, they've always been galvanized. Same thing. Well, it's not necessarily the same. This is a gal This is actually a poly pipe, so it's got the poly coating on it, so it'll last. So well, it's called a CMP. It's it's not a, a metal. It's a plastic corrugation. It, poly it poly right. HDPD or HP. That's a plastic pipe. Yeah. This is a metal pipe. So this is metal or or not? Are yes. These metal. It's it's a metal pipe with a poly coating. It's a coated pipe. Okay. So, so unless you cut the pipe some for some reason to shorten it or adjust the length, then it should be protected from rust and corrosion. Correct. Okay. Any other questions? I should point out that staff has asked for third and final on both of those, the police cars and on the culverts. So mm -hmm. this is both of these are this is a budget item, isn't it? Yes. Yeah. We move into um, a resolution appointing three people to the tree advisory board for three year terms ending in 2025. Are there any questions at all? Okay, we'll move to the last resolution, which is related to the fire department. Um, to enter into a contract not to exceed $147,976.68 with Stryker Medical uh, pursuant to a NASPO cooperative purchasing agreement for the purchase of four cardiac life pack 15 V4 monitors for use by the fire department. Chief, do you want to um, tell us what a life pack 15 V4 monitor is? I imagine it's not a car and it's not, it's not a four cylinder. <laughs> About the price of a car, isn't it? <laughs> yeah. A little bit more than a car, actually. Yeah, probably. So you got a, a document with that as well um, mm -hmm. that kind of tells a little bit about that. What the cardiac monitor is, it's a, it's a combination of, of done several things. It's what we use on the ambulance pretty much 90% of the time. When we go on an ambulance call, we hook, up, hook somebody up to a cardiac monitor. Uh, most of the time, just look at their heart rate and so forth. We're able to take the blood pressure, put the pulse socks on them. Um, so it reads that as well. It reads on carbon monoxide. It might be in the bloodstream if we end up in a carbon monoxide situation. Um, we can hook that up as well and uh, read that as well. We do uh, cardiac pacing with it, defibrillation. So if we have somebody at cardiac arrest, if we have somebody whose heart's not beating right, then we hook that device on them and we, and we um, turn that on and it, and it will pace for them. It will defibrillate when somebody's in, in a cardiac arrest and ventricular fibrillation. Uh, v attack or something like that, we can control it with that as well. And that's how we just monitor um, the heart as we go. We can also look at the wave wavelength of, um, of their CO, CO2 in the bloodstream, <coughs> um, their oxygen levels and so forth. We can watch those waveforms to make sure it's all, it's basically a, an ER monitor to look at in the ER that's in the back of an ambulance. And these are replacing ones that were bought back right prior to the Ambulance Service Incorporation, for those who remember that. Um, right before it went into the city of Bella Vista, they um, bought a lot of equipment to get the city up for the next 10 years or so, and that's basically what these are replacing four of those monitors. It's considered standard equipment nowadays. It is, it is standard, has been standard on the ambulances for many, many years, the cardiac monitor. They just come in different phases. So they go back in 11 years, because we purchased these in 2011, um, early 2011, um, right before the, the ambulance service went into the city in 12. They purchased these and they purchased three ambulances, and that's how we got the three ambulances to, you know, to spread out amongst our stations. But um, we've always had cardiac monitors, but these are these monitors that come out were some of the state-of-the-art monitors that nobody in the area had at the time. So we were able to look at things and determine and, and to make diagnoses with those monitors um, early on, you know, 10 years ago, so what like this, 11 years ago. So what this effectively does, Chief, is upgrade the system you yes. have now to current technology. That's correct. Life expectancy, five years, 10 years? They, um, we use a replacement around the 10, 11 year mark. So we'll keep them for about 10 or 11 years. Now they're usually, and, and, and think about it, we'll use the monitors we currently have, the four we're replacing, on our engines. So we'll put those monitors, on, we can still use them, they're still good, we still keep them main, maintenance, but they're, they're old, they're 11 years. We want you know, a better version, a newer version, to be able to you know, look at the person's heart. So. Okay. Any 
Any questions at all? And that's in the it's in the uh, capital projects. It's in the long range plan of, of replacement equipment for the ambulances. Thank you, Chief. Sounds good. Thank you. There will be one more item for you to consider on the agenda, and it's the first discussion item, which is a resurfacing bid that Superintendent Button wants to walk you through. Mike? Yeah, but of course, basically, the bid opening for that is actually tomorrow. Uh, I would have liked to have all the results where you guys could look at them this evening, but because I first set that bid up on the ARP, uh, their protocol for how you do that so it took a little bit longer time but of course then you all decided to do go a different route but my bid was already out uh, so that's the reason that the results are not coming this evening so you were faced with different bid rules correct. for the American Rescue Plan because you had to follow uh, federal rules that is correct but you'll have it open tomorrow, and uh, then we'll be ready to go for the council meeting That's correct. next Monday. Mike, basically, this... that I mean, you're talking, it's about like 60 miles that, that's on that bid packet. That's actually the most that we've ever put out. Uh, and, uh, you know, the expectation is obviously that the bids are going to be a lot more than they were last year. You know, I told you when when I was asking for the art money, you know, that I, you know, the crystal ball says probably somewhere in the 30 to 34 percent increase from what our prices were last year. And we'll see if that holds true when we do those bid openings tomorrow. Mike, just so I know, is this for overlay ancillary seal or just overlay? Yes, both, both okay. applications. Is it possible we'll have two low bidders, one for the slurry and one for the overlay? It is. It's possible? Okay. Although for the past few years, there's only been one slurry ever. Uh, actually, last year on the slurry, we had another player coming oh. out of uh, Joplin, Missouri that bid on it. Mm -hmm. So we actually have two two bidders for the slurry application, okay. which is good. I saw a hand move up. So, uh, well, I guess the council will probably get a heads up Thursday when the packet comes out. As yeah. Far as yeah, Jason will prepare it. Yeah. Assuming, assuming we have a, a budgeted item here, but if the bids should, for some reason, come in exceedingly high above expectation, do we are we able to carve that down into a budget level implementation yes. without compromising or rebidding? Yeah, I believe that I, in your packet you should have my bid specs, and they will refer to. The city has the right to either add quantities or delete quantities based on what we have within our budget. But and I, I do that every year. But usually there's a, some limitation as to how much you can add and how much you can deduct without affecting the bid prices. Well, it really they need to just be deductive alternates, not additive alternates. But the, right. The, 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 so uh, obviously we get those bids in so much a, a yard, a square yard. Is that how the bids come in? The story comes in by the square yard and the mm -hmm. asphalt's done by the ton. Okay, so you can buy up to, you run out of money for it based Correct. on that, yeah. So it's not, we're not committed to a certain number of, it's just as needed through the end of the contract, right? That is At correct. a certain price. Okay. So we don't buy any more than our budget allows. So. See what I mean? We, we, we've got a certain amount of budget. We're going to pay a certain amount per but unit. But we've still estimated the quantities. Yeah, and he's, esti yeah, he's estimating how much he'll, how many right. and so the linear miles he can do with that. Contractors anticipating a certain amount of work. Um, and so uh, that will generate a price. And if we cut it in half, because the prices have doubled, uh, well, if, if, if it exceeds the budget, then there are certain things we can do uh, if it's within a certain range of the existing budget. But if it totally blows the budget, then we'll have to do something else all, altogether. Well, I think he was asking if the price changes, if the quantity is too low. Well, basically what I do is I try to anticipate that price as close as I can by doing my research, talking to the vendors and that type of thing. And I also kind of... Uh, I, I cushion it a little bit. I mean, I don't try to get right on the money. 
you know, you know what I'm saying? That way, I always like to add instead of take away, because you're correct. The, the better the person that bids on it, they're not gonna be too happy if I cut, you know, $1 million out of something that they bid on, so. Or cut 25% out. And correct. Uh, that profit is, margin is based upon 100% of the project. Right. Yes, you can reduce some percentage down and spend, still come out whole. But, uh, yeah. Okay. Not that we've been so, doing every year. Yeah. So this list yeah. that we were provided, um, the bids that we'll be receiving will be to cover everything that you've got on that list, right? Uh, that is correct. Okay. Have we, I mean, this question, have we ever completed the whole entire list in a, in, in a calendar year? I mean, do we complete it every year? You know, I mean, what you're projecting to do. Have, are we? Yes. We have. Okay. Well, that's good. We usually exceed it, don't we? We, uh, we normally add two, and that, mm -hmm. that's what I just explained. Yeah. This is a little bit different this year, so. Okay. But May not be adding this year. Mm -hmm. I'm pretty confident that <laughs> we're not going to be cutting the streets. I will say one thing about that list. There's always possible, that's not set in stone, that list that y'all got. Because there's different reasons why streets can come off of there. So, uh, and I can go into those if you want, but there's just all kinds of different reasons why something, why the list. Not the amount of money, but the actual list itself can be kind of shuffled around. Since the overlay is on a price per ton basis, um, when the paver goes down the street, uh, the, the, the workmen running the paver can determine what the thickness is. No, and we can, determine what the thickness is. And so is that a specified item? It is. And, and we specify the amount of tons that go on a street. Sometimes they come under just a little under and maybe just a little over, but we monitor, we have people in the field to make sure that the amount of tonnage that they're putting on the street is exactly what, or close to what we got on the spreadsheet. And, and that tonnage is based upon what assumption? It's based, based on the width and depth of the asphalt, the width of the street and the depth and, of the and asphalt. What, and, and, that's, and you're getting down to the core that I'm looking for. What's, <laughs> knowing that all the streets vary in width, what is your normal target depth that they're to, to to place in the overlays? It depends on the street. Each street can be individual. And so when you go and look at street A, uh, it has a certain tonnage listed in your bid form. That's correct. Right. So that's your target. How does the kind of, how do you know, who knows what thickness they should be laying that at on that street then? The city knows that because I put it on the spreadsheet that that's what, that's the tonnage that they're going to put down on that street. So the thickness is shown someplace. Yes. Your target. So the contractor knows, the inspector knows. Yeah, I, it should be on your sheet there that I sent your packet. Or whatever. Okay. Okay. Any other questions? Thank you, Mike. <clears throat> so we'll have that ready for you for next Monday. In your package, there is a presentation that Emily's going to give us on what has the Vela Vista Trails manager accomplished yeah. <laughs> with your helmet and your bicycle and ready That's to go. That's me. You guys all have a copy of the packet? I do. Hopefully awesome. Okay. Well, I have some more copies if you need That's one. It's a polished report. <laughs> Thanks. Uh, so just to introduce myself to everyone, in case you don't know me, uh, my name is Emily Guffin and I am the trails manager for the city. Um, and the purpose of this presentation is uh, to provide an overview of my position and what I've accomplished so far um, in this position. Uh, I started back in September, so I'm approaching month number nine. Uh, so I have accomplished a fair amount and still have lots more to accomplish and many more goals. So during uh, the nine month period so far, I found that my work uh, sort of uh, goes into five main categories. And those five categories are project and grant management, community engagement, planning, uh, trail maintenance and enhancement, and event coordination. Uh, so I'll touch on a few highlights for each of these categories just to, to keep it brief. Um, you'll find more details in the packet, um, so feel free to re review that um, when you have more time. Uh, so for project and grant management, uh, I am in charge of pretty much all projects that are related to trails. So that includes any new soft surface trail, um, such as a new Rillington trail, um, any new trailheads, um, 
the tree planting along the Blowing Springs to uh, Metfield Greenway, as well as the Mercy Way Bridge Project. Uh, so for the Mercy Way Project, for example, uh, I'm in charge of the budget for that project. Um, and as you know, it's a hefty budget, about a uh, little under $8 million. Um, so I keep track of invoices. Um, I seek reimbursement from RDOT. I provide grant reports uh, to all of the funding sources that we have. Um, and then I work with the contractor to um, ensure that we meet our timeline and uh, the project is meeting standards and then that we come in at or under budget. Uh, the next category for community engagement, uh, what I do for this is I, I actively work to try to um, involve community members in, in all things trails. Um, so that involves working with uh, volunteers on trail maintenance uh, through the Friends of Arkansas Single Track uh, Trail Adoption Program, uh, interacting with both residents and with visitors uh, via social media, uh, spreading the word about uh, everything that trails have to offer uh, via the city's new uh, series in the weekly uh, Vista. I don't know if you guys have seen, we have had two stories so far, a third one will be coming out soon also with Bennett Horn, so thank you, Bennett. Um, and then also working with local nonprofits, uh, such as the Bella Vista Foundation and um, also the Bella Vista Arts Council to add color and excitement to our trails. Uh, my goal in uh, this area, the community engagement area of work, is to just make sure that all residents are, are heard, that their uh, mm -hmm. voices are heard, that their needs and desires are being addressed uh, by the city and that they feel that they can be a part of the trails community, even if they're not a mountain biker or a runner or a hiker or, or any of that. They can just go out and, and stand or watch birds or, or do whatever they want to do. Uh, next category is planning, and that involves uh, all types of planning. So regional planning, uh, local planning, and the development review type of planning. Uh, so for regional planning, uh, I work very frequently with the Northwest Arkansas Regional Planning Commission. Um, and I also serve on the board for the Razorback Greenway Alliance. Um, and that involves just uh, making sure that Bella Vista is at the table for regional conversations that uh, were included in their plans and that our priority connections are shown in the regional plans. Uh, for local planning, I work with uh, the POA and Trailblazers, City of Bentonville, um, Oz Trails to make sure that the city also has a seat at the table for those important trail conversations. Um, feels like in the past, Bella Vista has, has been left out of a lot of conversations, and so I'm trying hard to make sure that what we want is reflected in what other people are, are saying. And then, uh, uh, last part of planning is reviewing development plans for all new trail projects. Um, so that includes looking uh, at trail proposals to make sure they're up to code and then also making sure that they're in line with our general plan um, and trails plan. Um, I'm pretty proud that uh, within the eight months I've been in this position, uh, we've already added five new miles of trails, um, three miles of which are uh, trails suited for families and people walking, not necessarily mountain biking, though they're also open to mountain biking. Um, and then we're also working to add one more trailhead. So. Um, hopefully that, that trend will keep going. All right, next category is uh, trail maintenance and enhancement. Uh, and so for trail maintenance, uh, prior to my role, trail maintenance uh, issues were reported in a variety of ways um, and also to a variety of people, um, some, of, uh, some people of whom were not related at all to the trail issue. And so in my position, I have uh, worked to be the person who receives all trail maintenance requests, and then I delegate uh, that request to the appropriate party. Um, the appropriate party could be the POA, a volunteer, uh, trailblazers, the city, et cetera. Um, and having a sole spokesperson definitely expedites the process and helps to <laughs> resolve maintenance issues uh, much more efficiently than going all over the place. And then lastly, uh, last part of my job is working with event promoters and organizers uh, just to make sure that events run smoothly on Bella Vista trails. So that involves uh, helping the organizer plan the event course, uh, working with police and EMS to make sure that all participants, are, participants of the event are safe and that drivers on the roads are aware that a, an event is happening. And then lastly, also making sure that trash and flagging and any other sort of event um, materials are removed 
uh, within a quick time frame after the event uh, so that our trails are, are clean for other people to use. So going forward, uh, I have a lot of goals for this position, um, but I found that um, all my goals are sort of related to the one idea of how can we better put Bella Vista on the map. Um, I'm sure everyone knows that Fentonville is very famous for mountain biking. It's the mountain bike capital of the world, but uh, in reality, it seems that most of Bentonville's trails are actually in Bella Vista. Um, and so uh, I'm trying to, to think about how we can ensure that people are visiting and returning to Bella Vista, not just Bentonville, um, time after time. And then also how we can use uh, Bella Vista's trails to increase Bella Vista's economic uh, base. Uh, so th those, are, those are two big goals and then, then lots of other goals. Um, and then the last two pages of the packet are uh, just a piece of one of the things I do for community engagement, and that's just uh, producing monthly trail count reports. So I've attached an example of uh, the March 2022 trail count report. Um, so as you can see in the report, we recorded a total of 32,000 users uh, for just that one month, 31 days, uh, which works out to an average of a little over 1,000 users per day, which in my opinion, is, is a huge number. I'm, I'm pretty happy with that number. Um, and if you look at how it compares to 2020 and 2021, uh, 2022 numbers are the highest yet. So that shows that Bella Vista is still a popular place to visit. Um, how so did we determine the numbers? How do we determine them? Yeah. Yeah, so we have uh, trail counters, electronic trail counters on our trails. Okay. We have 10 of them, and uh, they basically sense motion. Well, that's just all you need to know. You, you oh. don't have somebody out there. <laughs> no. Like, no, no, like, no one's out there. No. It's, 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 like like it's like a treasure count. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah, very similar. Yeah, Steve had a clicker. You just go out. <laughs> that's where you got your carpal tunnel. That's right. <laughs> Sorry, Emily. Yeah, so, so that's it. Um, happy to answer any questions. Yeah. Yes. Good. One question is, uh, in, in looking at the goals and, and uh, uh, goals for the future. How does that how does that fit? Are you familiar with our 2040 plan that we've adopted? There's a lot of stuff on mm -hmm. trails in that plan. Yeah. And so how does this fit with that plan? And, and is the plan good as far as your ex seven months of vision now of what we have versus what the plan says? Yeah. Uh, so I, it's a lot of questions all in one. But uh, no, no, that's a great question. And um, that's a big part of my position because we have that plan and then we also have uh, the 2015 trails plan. Um, and so I, I am reviewing both of those as we go along to make sure that all new proposals and, and when we communicate as a staff um, to make sure that we're developing new proposals that are in line with those plans. And for the 2040 plan, absolutely, we are looking uh, to follow a lot of the goals in there that are related to trails and transportation and increasing connections to um, hubs uh, throughout Bella Vista. So absolutely, that's, that's a big part. You have a degree in planning, do you not? I have a master's degree in planning, yep. Uh, yes, council members, no. Is there any way to measure the economic impact uh, on an, from an event or maybe on a quarter basis? Uh, the trails um, had this much Im uh, economic impact Vista. Is there any way to come up with those kind of numbers? Mm -hmm. Yeah, there is. There are uh, a variety of ways to determine that. Uh, and Brandon Kelly with Discover Bella Vista actually already uh, produces some reports related to that. Um, and the Oz Trails Off Road, which unfortunately isn't happening this coming year, but for their 2021 event, also produced a report showing the economic impact um, of that event on trails. And most of the way that they quantify that is through um, the uh, hotels, so lodging um, via hotels or Airbnbs or friends, uh, restaurant, um, people that tend to go into restaurants, uh, gas purchases, all of that. So there, there are ways to quantify it, though it's a lot of estimation. Is there a way that um, Airbnbs track um, like an increase in um, occupancy during a, an event? Uh, we just, you know, hired Granicus uh, company, you know, to help mm -hmm. us identify the uh, short-term rental uh, properties that we have in Bella Vista. So, you know, historically in the past, we probably, you know, we don't have any data on that, but moving forward, you know, we should be able to. I could tell you, we've had weekends where we've all, we've had like 
especially during events where we had like almost 100% occupancy of our short-term rentals. I mean, it's the uh, you know usage of those is is, is tremendous. Yeah, and I'll tag tag on to that that. Um, with the trail count reports and with the Granicus data, I think it, we could get a lot more data on um, visitor usage versus uh, resident usage on trails because we can look at a certain weekend that, whether it's spring break, break weekend or President's Day or July 4th and compare the Airbnb usage to the trail count usage and determine how many of those users were here for the trails. Yeah, we could also you know do counts of usage you know, on uh, Whenever we have some type of a activity going on, right, mm -hmm. versus weekends when we don't, exactly, you know, and see what the uh, occupancy is. But like I said we're just kind of going down that path right now. Mm -hmm. So, yes, I have a statement and a question. First of all, I'd like to say that it's super clear that our decision to make your position full time <laughs> was the correct one. And uh, the one thing I found out, I was really shocked at is the number of volunteers in TAP. Mm -hmm. I, I don't remember what the number was, but it's incredibly high. And it's what, <laughs> interestingly enough, is way higher in Bella Vista than Bentonville. Yeah. I it was like 180 or something. It was some I think high it might number. even be right over 200. Yeah. yeah These it, are volunteers that are helping with the trail, helping to keep it fixed up and whatnot. Because we're all concerned about the uh, you know, maintenance costs and whatnot. Mm -hmm. uh, Liquor and other things. You know, so, but. Uh, yeah, the number of people, and some of them aren't bikers, and they're just people living near the trail and offered to, you know, help with that area. But I thought that was pretty cool. I, I think the volunteers are great. Steve? Would, would anybody other than me think that it would be, because that seems to be the number one complaint from the trails complainers is that what is costing Bella Vista, and we're get, not getting any kind of return from it. Oh, we get return, believe me. I mean, would it, would, wouldn't would it be beneficial to us to have a, a number, some kind of a number, maybe on a quarterly basis or something, some kind of a number periodically that that you know, we could provide to the media that... that um, there was a, a, but we've just really gotten a source where we're able to start, you know, tracking something like that with a little more... The last time we had hard numbers was 2018. Yeah when, I'm trying to remember her name, was doing her thesis. Mm -hmm. Down at U of A. Uh, down at U of A. And she went out and I think she interviewed 380 people. And she was able to figure out how much are they spending every day just by talking to them and then extrapolating and using statistical analysis. And the number I think was 217 or $271 a day. And um, so when you multiply by the number of people we've got here, Yes, there definitely is. And when you talk to Allen's and some of the restaurants, they're seeing more and more cyclists coming in and spending money. Well, the other thing is, I don't think you're ever going to get an accurate number. All the realtors say it's had a huge effect on the real estate. And, mm -hmm. I mean, there's oh, a real estate mm -hmm. boom a lot of places, but I've, every realtor I've talked to said there's no question. It's, no. it's made a big difference. Well, homes on trails, you know, it's had about the same... Uh, effect on them is it had you know homes on lakes or homes on golf courses uh, you know anybody you talk to that yeah. has home on yeah. trail and homes on trails are highly desired yeah they are so steve Henley, <laughs> thank you for your presentation very concise and thoughtful thank you for doing that uh i know that it's uh, a lot of times when we're talking about these trails people's first thoughts go to what's the economic impact mm -hmm. but uh for me the number one benefit of the trails in Bella Vista is the fact that Bella Vista residents get to use them. Mm -hmm. uh, I use them, my family uses them, uh, my neighbors use them. There's probably 20 kids on my block that run the trails uh, to have fun. Mm -hmm. When I'm out there uh, on the trails myself, and I do probably more hiking than I do mountain biking. Mm -hmm. uh, I like to take my dog in the woods. and. Uh, I like to talk to the people out there, and I love running into Bella Vista residents. And so for me, economic impact, that's great, and we should be thoughtful about that. But for me, the number one benefit is the fact that we get to use those trails. Yeah. Uh, we've been through two years of pandemic, and the trails have represented freedom to a lot of people, to me, for sure. I can't imagine 
a better place to live <laughs> through the pandemic than Bella Vista, Arkansas. I, I think about people that don't even have a back porch, that live in an urban area and don't really even have a back porch to sit on. For us to have this kind of freedom and this kind of adventure and this, this uh, natural environment to, to be present in, I think is so valuable to our residents. You know, when we go back to the economic development drive as well, we've all seen um, Matt Tire mm -hmm. and its development. And I know Tim Robinson well enough that he would not be doing the outlay of capital if he didn't think it was going to work, uh, work for him. And then where the Legion was is going to be um, a pub called Shredders. And it's called that because when you're on the trails, you tend to shred your tires on the rocks. And so that's going to drive more economic development. And I think, Doug, aren't you doing um, an in-house administrative review um, from the gentleman that's bought it? It doesn't Correct. have to go to the planning it, commission. It, that depends on how extensive the remodel is, but we are looking at it. Yeah. And he's got a lot of plans. He's going to use a lot of the existing things like the outdoor, outdoor at the back. He's even talking of perhaps putting in a drive-in coffee thing by tape. Uh, using the container, if you've seen the one off 279 that's in Gravit. And um, so he's got lots of great ideas. And again, it's all driven by the, by the bikers and, and the hikers and the runners. <laughs> you know, S Steve was referring to the kids on history, about 20 or so to use it. I, I am the kid on <laughs> history. It's and it's pretty amazing, you know? I mean, I'm not going to lie. I'm like 64, right? And everybody's passed that back. The number of people who are 70, 75, or maybe even more, uh, I'm really surprised up and down the street how many actually go. So I live over by uh, Scottsdale Golf Cart parking lot. So, you know, that's a great place to park and for yep. people to go either direction, right? Mm -hmm. uh, and, um, you know, they walk down the bottom of the hill and, and walk along the creek is really nice route. It's really nice it's and flat, pretty, it's secluded. Mm -hmm. uh, I was out a day of snow and ice, like I think the first day we had, and I thought I'd be the only person. And I drove my, because I love to walk on, I really do. It's mm -hmm. just really peaceful, it's nice, it's quiet. It's a little chilly, layer up close, not a problem. There were six cars in the Colin Hills parking lot that day. People went wow. down and parked and still were out walking those trails. It was really surprising. That's awesome. Yeah, and so yeah, very nice presentation. I appreciate it. I can tell you you're getting a lot done and you're really involved. I do have a question about the, Raz the Razorback Greenway. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, so when we went to the uh, bridge uh, mm -hmm. groundbreaking, yep. and there was a representative of the Trailblazers there, mm -hmm. and he talked about the future plans and going up into like Jane and Missouri and on up that direction. Where it goes past that, I don't know. Mm -hmm. But that's the future vision. Mm -hmm. But it was kind of like important to me that that crossing Little Sugar Creek or the, the bridge on 340 might be an impediment to doing that. Mm -hmm. Do you know anything about that? And if it is an impediment, would you be involved in trying to help find a solution for that if it is? Yeah, I would absolutely be involved with um, anything related to the Razorback Greenway. I'm currently working with uh, planning staff and then also the Trailblazers and Aaron Rushing um, to determine an alignment that goes up through the, the Sugar Creek Valley as opposed to going elsewhere in Bella Vista to sort of create the backbone of active transportation. Um, and so we're, we're looking at options right now to sort of follow Sugar Creek and then do get up to the bridge on Lancashire at 340. Um, and so we'll be addressing all of the impediments that we cross there, and, and there are a lot of impediments. So, yeah, that will be part of my job. Pretty confident they can figure it out. I sure hope so. Yes, yeah. I'm, I'm confident. We're going to get it done, and, and hopefully it will be within a reasonable time frame. Okay. Good. Any other questions? Sir? Uh, our 2040 plan uh, has lots of... Uh, things for alternative transportation in the city and, and it emphasizes uh, a bus service it emphasizes cycling along the roadways mm -hmm. and is there and, and it suggests i think some areas where we plan for that uh, to be done along the roadways i've mm -hmm. been uh, talking about with, uh, alderman flynn and and, and his crew uh, challenging them as to what are they doing in this year's uh, paving program mm -hmm. to complement and uh, actually conform with what the 2040 plan tells us to do. 
yeah. uh, about adding trails uh, or adding width to pavements, and, and that, that's a whole whole separate challenge. But I think the challenge can be met. I've personally done some of that on my own, but for widening of the roadway, not for bicyclists. But the function is the same, mm -hmm. and we have many areas uh, of our arterials that are suitable for that. Yeah. Uh, it's a matter of the methodology and, and implementation for it. Uh, and then you may go and get a mile of widening, and then you hit a half mile where you can't widen. Mm -hmm. uh, but you can deal with that, I think, in the planning and the, in the actual implementation process. So how does that fit into your program here? Have you mm -hmm. talked at all with Mike about it and the street committee about how to go after some of those things? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, I have absolutely thought about it. Um, I feel that Bella Vista has a really great uh, soft surface trail system right now, but a very poor on-road um, active transportation network, and that includes sidewalks and bike lanes. And we have the Blowing Springs to Metfield uh, path, which is wildly successful. You see everyone using it. Um, but pretty much all other roads are, are very unsafe for walking and, and biking unless you live on a local neighborhood street. Um, and so within the planning department, we're looking at uh, roads that uh, would provide um, the best connection for the highest number of people from uh, neighborhood centers to trailheads to shopping plazas, commercial corridors. Um, I'm looking to see if we could develop um, at a minimum uh, sharrows, like the, like the symbol painted on the road, but ideally bike lanes or even separated bike lanes or, or even a side path similar to the Blowing Springs, the Metfield Greenway. So that way we can get more people safely from their house to um, whatever destination they want to get to as opposed to driving their car a half mile to get there. Um, I have not talked to Mike actually, but that, that's a fantastic idea. Um, and I think if we pursued um, some of the federal grant opportunities that are out there uh, together, I think that we could definitely accomplish some of those in the near term future, honestly. In 2017 or 2018, mm -hmm. we actually brought in half. Yep. And they were looking at coming down Rogers Road mm -hmm. onto Chelsea, mm -hmm. half, H A L F F. Uh, I think so, yeah. yeah. And, um, and going up Chelsea because on, on Sunday, there were a lot of people who ride their bikes on Chelsea because mm -hmm. they like the curves yeah. and the hills, yeah. Yeah. but it's it's not safe. It's not safe. And not safe for the driver or the, or that's the bicycles. Right. Yeah. And some and people walk their dogs right down the middle of Chelsea yeah, they as well. <laughs> and so they actually put together um, a whole plan where they would have off-road separate sidewalks, for lack of a better word, mm -hmm. to help them get up the hill and then come down, and they went all the way around Chelsea, and then they looked at Reardon because they were trying to get down into the commercial area, and Reardon is bad. Reardon has nothing. And so they actually, they actually found um, a potential trail that they could put, put through the bush that I think is now part of, of Little Sugar. Mm -hmm. And so they did all this, and the price tag was I think you remember this, John. It was about 3.1, 3.2 million. Yeah, it was pretty high. And Doug, Doug might have been here too. And so I, I went cap in hand and, and had a discussion with the Walton Family Foundation, and they basically said perhaps another day. <laughs> yeah. But yeah, you're right. But I, I like Emily's idea to really study the city, and and there's different connections you'd like to make, and to figure out which are which are the best to do first, you know, but get the most people off the road. And I'll tie it into the 2040. Because you'd have to do a little study to figure out, because you know you can't do them all right away. Mm -hmm. And that way you could figure out, hey, this is one that really would be good to start with. Exactly. Plus the federal grant would be great, <laughs> obviously. All righty. Thank you very much. Thank, Thank you. Thank you. If I could add something from the, from the uh, newspaper standpoint that she was talking about the series, uh, when Emily and Cassie approached us about doing that, I was very excited about it because it not only you know provides me free content to fill space, but it's great local content. And then when I saw the list of uh, story ideas that they had, 
Um, I mean, it, it, not all of them are, you know, hey, we're going to go walk on this trail. Here's this trail. And uh, the last one we ran was uh, Patty Irwin, who uh, is uh, an arborist and talked about the trees and, and foliage, uh, which I thought was very interesting. They're kind of, you know, a little bit outside the box looking at trail systems uh, and the people that use them and uh, how they keep them going. We, uh, we run it the last Wednesday of every month and they've got it planned out through December. Uh, we went to our graphic uh, artist and she put together a little logo. Uh, it's called The Dirt. Uh, they liked that suggestion and I loved it, you know, so uh, it works good and uh, we're real excited to have it in there. We've gotten good comments about it and uh, it's, it's just not, it's not your average uh, series, uh, trail series that you think about, but there's certainly a lot of good content in it, uh, I, I think, and I, I'm tickled to death that we've got it and I look forward to it, you know, every Wednesday, you know, and read it two or three times. You read your own work? I, every now and then I read mine, but I really read theirs. Yeah, <laughs> theirs is really good. But uh, I'm glad that we're able to, to supply space for that. One last question. You've got 10 trail monitors that are counters out there. Mm -hmm. Are those accessible by your cell phone? Do they report daily with numbers, or how do, how do you extract the data from there? Yeah, so I collect them on a monthly basis uh, with my computer. Um, so I just go go to them. There's a magnetic key that I have that transfers the data from the counter to my computer. So you have to physically yep. visit the station sites. Okay. Yep. Right. They're strapped to trees, are they not? Yep, they're strapped to trees. Yeah, you keep your eye out to see them. Yeah, you have a little map to, to go off of on the second, last page of the packet. So, you can try to find so, them. so how sophisticated is that electronic counting system such that you can get a call in daily uh, on a cell phone or that you can interrogate it with your cell phone or that? Uh, I don't believe you can uh, access it via your cell phone, or at least I haven't figured that out yet. Um, I can collect on a daily basis. It just involves me going there to Physically download contacting. the data, um, okay. which is why I tend to do it more on a monthly basis. Um, but, but it is very dependable data and, and easy to collect with my computer. Well, you give her a lot more money. She buy a more sophisticated system. Mm -hmm. There you go. Well, it just seems to work out just fine, and she gets her exercise growing and done. <laughs> well, I'm, I'm, I'm not suggesting that we necessarily do that way. But you're not. I, I was curious as to how, how we did collect the data and. Uh, and uh, I, can I ask you something? Of since I, we'll let the elected people talk, do we have? Uh, circumstances happen a lot where our trail crossing mechanisms are damaged mm -hmm. by vehicles. I know there's one that looked like got creamed off Reardon. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and it's still down. And yeah. and so, I, you know, it could be that happened and we don't know who did it, but uh, I'm certainly willing to help. We can need to file claims on people's liability insurance so the city can get reimbursed for those, yeah. putting those back. Yeah, I th we do have incidents with uh, some of our trail crossing signs and mm -hmm. the um, pedestrian hybrid beacons. The one on Reardon, was hit by a drunk driver, um, and we actually did um, get reimbursed by Geico for that. Um, the reason it hasn't been replaced yet is because that will be the location of a future tunnel, and so we figured it was a better investment for us to use that money for a different um, part of the trail system and, and just have the tunnel go underneath the road. So, uh, but can we retrieve? Isn't, there, isn't it still down? Uh, no, it's been picked up. Yeah, been picked up. the, the oh, damaged part has been a, picked up. There's a I'll sign one, 20 yeah. yards short of it that uh, is not down. That's what I saw, okay. Yeah. And, yeah. And, and there's a yellow The mechanism come down, but the sign went down later, and it's yeah. still laying there. Okay. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Talking about those non-beacon signs, because mm -hmm. uh, Doug and I were talking about one today. Who was responsible for the trail maintenance on those signs is it the city or is it actually the POA based on our current agreement and the POA should then be out there finding the contractor to put it in play and we pay our our 50 percent is that the way it works that's typically the way that it would work um, anything that's included <coughs> within the trail license agreement um, would be covered by uh, POA in the city at 50% split uh, for each party. But is it actually the POA? So because it's tricky. they had the maintenance. It's tricky because the trail uh, license agreement only covers 20 feet on either side of the trail center line. 
Um, and so some of the trail crossing signs, the ones that say trail crossing ahead that are located 50 to 100 feet in front of the, uh, the crosswalk, I don't believe are covered within the uh, uh, license agreement because they're without, or um, they extend beyond the, the 20 foot. Those are the roadway signs. notification signs required by the? By the MUTCD standard. The MUTCD, those are just like a school crossing or a mm -hmm. speed limit sign or a fire crossing sign. Those are okay. Notifications. Okay, terrible. So, do, do we need to try and amend the agreement that we have then? Well, to well, I, that? I mean, I, I, of course, it's, it's up to you, but I, I, I don't, uh, I'd have to go back and look at it, look at a particular circumstance, but I, I'm not sure that we need to look at changing anything. I, I, I mean, we have signs that get creamed by people driving all the time, and so it's, uh, something that uh, we know how to deal with through making claims on it. Mike does it for street signs. In a case like this, it's just maybe seeing between Emily and Mike who's gonna do that one because it's a sign, you know, maybe we don't wanna double up on something like that, or actually I guess it would be Karen over at the street department. But I mean, there have been times we just, in the past, I know we've just had, before Emily got here, we just kinda have a little, have a little chat and figure out who's gonna do what and, and get it done. I, I'm not sure we need to. We one, make anything. One, one last question. The uh, crossing on 279 in front of the police department uh, new facility, that's going to be relocated. Will all of those lights and everything get moved someplace else? I actually wasn't aware that that was going to get relocated. So, no, I don't, I don't believe so. Relocated. The mm -hmm. Yeah, that's not going to be moved. That's going to stay. So only the trail that's from, from the east side of the right of way, the trail that crosses the property, is that the one that's going to get rerouted? So the trail that yeah the trail used to go through the police station like through the building right now it goes along the uh, 279 between 279 and the building uh, south and then goes into that um, uh, ravine ravine area yeah so it's not going to go yeah it, it's rerouted thank you everyone all right mr burke Boat storage, and I understand you and Mr. Tapp have been talking about this. We had a chat about it today. You know, this uh, came from a resident uh, who had received a notice of a violation, and I'm sure everybody on the council gets these calls from time to time, somebody wanting to know if there's anything we can do to help them. And of course, the first thing you do is look at, you know, what does the ordinance say, make sure you understand that part of it. Uh, so in a, this is a specific example, but it, it kind of did get me thinking that I thought it'd be good for us to have a conversation around a, a more, a broader conversation around the kinds of things where there's replication between the ACC and the city. And in some cases, uh, are there things that we're doing, maybe we adopted it from the ACC when the city was first formed, and should we revisit some of those things that it might, uh, the benefit of it might be to take some of the load off of our inspector team? Uh, are there things that they're doing that maybe they just really wish they didn't have to do that? This, this picture that we're looking at here is, is kind of the, as I say, the specific instance. 25 Scalloway Drive, uh, this gentleman's got a boat alongside his house. And it's kind of a nice setup, really. I could see where, you know, you look at that and go, you know, that's not offensive to me. Uh, I think what the ordinance says is it should be screened in all practicality that there should be a fence in front of it so that you can't see it in any way from the street. Right. And, you know, when we cite somebody for something like this, there's a certain amount of bad will that comes with it. And there's part of me that wants to think, as a city, we want to be recognized as, as the adult in the room, the responsible party when it comes to things like this, and that we might yield that lane to the ACC if there's certain things that they feel like are really important to keep the aesthetic quality. There are a few homes, obviously, they're not part, not under the jurisdiction of the ACC. Not very many, though. And so when I looked at this, it made me start thinking in broader context. Anybody find anything wrong with this particular setup? The gentleman's got a nice, you know. Is nice somebody complaining or we're just picking on something? Good question. I think typically 
Doug, you do better at this than I would. Typically, it's based on a complaint. You get a complaint on his book? Okay. And sometimes, you know, that can be dynamics between neighbors that aren't, oh, I you know, that. yeah, it's not, you know, it's, but I, it's well, not that somebody really upset. me at all, but yeah. people are people. Right. And anytime a code officer goes to look at this complaint, they're going to look at everything on the way there, do a survey, because if you write a notice to this gentleman, um, he's going to talk to his neighbors, and if there's another boat that you didn't write a notice to, they're going to be calling me and asking, well, why did you write him one and not me one? So everybody on the road, any violation seen on the way there back or a 360 survey will get noticed. Because that seems like it's a long ways from the road. Yeah. Doug, it's Doug, almost in his backyard. Is there a difference between what we do and what the ACC is looking for? Yes. As far as screening goes, I don't believe so. It looks identical to me. I looked at both of them today. And this, for us, if, if there was interest in changing the specific, I'm, I'm interested in hearing uh, council members' uh, comments on the specific case, but also on the more general approach. It would be easy to change the ordinance <coughs> that doesn't require screening. Uh, it says vehicles, vehicles, and it describes in another part that that means boats, such as that, may not be parked forward of the front of the house and must be screened with an opaque screen as defined in another section, opaque screen, fence, or yep. something of the like, uh, so that any such vehicles may not be seen from any city street. That, that's tough for people. We live in a lake community. Uh, this gentleman's gone out of his way to make a nice area. I wish we didn't have to give notice. So let me ask the question before we start going down this too far. How many of you are getting complaints about boats? Zero in 12 years. I'm not received. I will say this, okay? I was excited for exactly the same thing before I was a city council member. Okay, I didn't know, I didn't know what the ordinance was, okay? Uh, and I was like, oh, okay, really? And I'm so, so just from my perspective at the time, it was like, well, I don't really like it. I had to figure out something I was gonna do with my boat, right? And, but I said, I get it. It's like, sometimes you don't have to like what you understand. And I think, it's kind of a slippery slope in a way. Because there's also not a house right next door to this. Mm -hmm. What if there's a house right next door? And two, you know, you say not forward of the house and, or it has to be behind the house. So how far down the house is acceptable? There was a house, a gentleman took me by it. Uh, he had another thing going on with his wife, a business across the street in the home. He goes, can you get in the car with me? I wanna go show you a couple things. And he showed me a couple scenarios just like this. One of the boats, no joke, was like a 32-foot cruiser. That, the boat was bigger than the house. Yeah. <laughs> no, I'm not even exaggerating at all. So, and I think it's, 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 it's a probably a situation-by-situation situation kind of a thing, right? And, it, it, and it's, I don't know where the slippery slope starts. You know, you start not policing this, I guarantee you, if you, especially if you make it known and all at once people can just put boats by, beside their house and not be shielded or whatever, you'll start getting calls. And when I saw this on the agenda, I would just notice them going up and down my street, right? I'm just looking. And if, if we just all at once have boats start showing up beside houses, it would cause an issue. So I hear you. Uh, I tell you though, so I'm from small town America, right? And you can go into that town, drive around, and you'll find boats, and you'll find campers, and you'll find all kinds of stuff. Because it's not just going to be boats. You're going to, what about a, a, tra a trailer of some type or a pop up camper? You're going to start seeing all kinds of things, unless you designate it specifically to boats. You're going to start seeing all kinds of stuff. And what's acceptable and what isn't. Yep. I personally like a clean aesthetic look of the community personally again i got cited i found a solution for it didn't really like it at the time but i got it i understood it so I, that's my feedback if it came before the council to do something with this i'll be honest with you i don't know i'd have to see i have to see what 
what the adjustment to the ordinance was. I don't we, know. we had a way back when the fence thing came up, we went around and around and around for months. As how tall can this fence be? Where can you put it? And what it could look like? And you know, finally it, it got done, but it took a while. And then it turned around and exempted golf cart trailers. Well, but it was a long six month process to get everybody on the same page about screening your camper. And then if, if, you, if you got it screened, was your screen high enough kind of thing. You know, someone even mentioned a little screening that's behind the police station because the little plastic shed that I bought for storage was two feet above the top of the fence. Everything else was right, except for the type of the fence. But Do you get many um, complaints about boats like this? We get a fair amount, especially on years where they draw down a lake. And everybody oh, that has a boat on the don't lake. Don't we make a, a special provision for we, that? We do, we do, but they still don't stop the complaints. I mean, the plaintiff, sure. they still come and we go make a visit and we start a case just in case the lake comes back up and the boat's still sitting there a month from now. They would, you know, but we do extend a grace period for that. Yeah. Larry? It, it's my recollection that we, uh, we mistreat <coughs> or treat boat owners and camper owners differently than we treat golf golf enthusiasts who have golf cart trailers and golf cart carts themselves on the trailers. And it's my understanding when the city went through a review of this part of our zoning code a, a number of years ago, and I know I spoke spoke to a spoke to it at the Planning Commission is that I wanted, I thought it would be appropriate for us to treat, because we have seven lakes, we have seven golf courses, to treat owners of boats in a similar fashion that we permit owners of golf carts and golf cart trailers. Because you can park a golf cart trailer with a cart on top of it right in your front yard. In fact, it can be up near the front of the house here. It doesn't have to be pushed to the back in the concealing process, you can park it right out in front. In fact, you can park it in front of your garage and it's legal. Five by 10 or smaller. Right. Is that is that what it is? Because I was thinking uh, exactly that. I was looking for it in here, five by five by 10. Uh, to Doug's point, nobody wants to see a 30 foot, you know, giant boat right. on the yeah, side yeah. of any house there. Yeah. But, but you're could, not gonna could we get the clean scenarios. You're gonna get a 32 foot 1972 Pontone right. that had right. been touched in yeah. 20 years right. with storage stuff on it. I mean, I don't know when you drove to Hawassi recently, but there's 3,500 boats in storage uh, between here and Hawassi. Yeah. And so I'm sure that those are all. But I wonder business. if simply we could be more, less restrictive, let's say, just by increasing that footprint from five by 10 to you know, limit pontoon boats and things like that that would be unsightly. Uh, but even go from you five to, to for a ten boat. by twenty or something. What, yeah, that's you know, probably a twenty-five foot trailer. I mean, you're going to have to extend. You think? It. Yeah. 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 yeah but the even if we were, won't fit in the garage. Yeah. Doug, yeah. even if we were to become more lenient, I don't suspect the ACC would become more lenient. No, they wouldn't. No. But then that's the ACC. Right. Then they're going to come and, <laughs> and do their thing regardless. <laughs> Perhaps so, they didn't in this case. It was written by the city. Can I? Sure. I, I was around. <laughs> so, um, in fact, I wrote that. And so I, I was not fully behind the scene. But what, here, here's the general issue in Bella Vista that a lot of people have. They will have an aesthetic issue with their neighbor. They drive by and they see a boat. And before there was ever a city, they would contact the ACC about it because it violates some rule of the ACC or one of their policies. And it got to the point where they, they wouldn't do anything. Now, they've gotten a little more aggressive in their enforcement, but the complaint at that time was they're not doing anything. They, being, they being the ACC. ACC. Okay. And so came to the city at one point through the council or the mayor at the time, I don't recall how it got generated, but they wanted the city to do something about this so they could go out and take care of this. And so the city adopted an ordinance and we went down this road because people wanted that controlled and there wasn't sufficient. You know, these are issues, these aesthetic things are issues that are made for private homeowners associations and POAs to deal with. 
This is what they do. The color of the fence. The, right. Can we see the boat? Does it have to be screened? All that. And we've got a situation in Bella Vista where they, maybe they don't like what's happening there. There's like this implied, I'm going to appeal to the city and get them to do it. And I, that's not necessarily the case. You know, we, we're, we deal with public health, safety, and welfare, and we can do these things, and we've done this. I would just caution you, if you change the rule, we've got one example, you will hear 150 people that don't want it changed. Or you're gonna, there'll be an article about that you're going to start allowing bigger boats, and we don't want this. It will light a fire, symbolically. Uh, on, on stuff like this, because people in this community, and rightly so, they want it to be neat, think that we're going to do something to make it less neat, and they're not going to like it. You're not going to be able to limit it to just boats. I guarantee no. you there'll be another round of this, well, my neighbor has this boat, and it's this big, well, I've got a pop-up camper, and it's not even as big mm -hmm. as that boat, but you won't let me park it there. Right. And okay, now we're going to allow pop-up camp. I don't know. I, it's, it's a tough one. I get it. Yeah, I yeah. really do. I mean, I bet. Well, uh, associated with that, you have a lot of lawn caretakers, and they have, some of them have single axle trailers, some of them have dual axle trailers, and they'll park those in their front yard, in their driveway, uh, on weekends and evenings. And it's an issue that, unless it gets called in as a complaint item, uh, that's another thing that's not not acceptable by our code, as I understand. Correct. Uh, but it, it's it's a I, ha I have one in my neighborhood. He has a single axle trailer. It does lawn care. Well, he'll have the tractor sitting on there with his weed eater and everything parked in his driveway. Well, I don't think anyone's complained about it, but. It is a thing, and it is not just in my neighborhood. There are others I've observed around the city. So, One of the benefits also of having us pass an ordinance is if you're the office two doors down, that's the ACC, now they're not going to be concerned about it at all. So now they get to push all that off on the city. Right. So, and or, or what, <laughs> I, well, we'll say this. they have The ACC does not do nothing now. Uh, I regularly, they uh, are filing new lawsuits against people subject to the covenants. I've seen several for uh, basically what we would call unsightly and sanitary conditions on a lot. They have a lot more, they can be a lot more general and use a lot more power in that. Uh, they don't have to follow the Constitution, we do as the government. So they can hold people to the private agreements and they have a lesser burden of proof and, and all this sort of stuff. And so they're able to uh, pursue that through private counsel, and they do that. And that helps what we try to do. I, you know, I don't, we don't really communicate. I don't know that we directly communicate with one another about those things. I just see where they get filed in court. And I was surprised last year to see how many they are filing. Mm -hmm. And uh, so, anyway, that's, yep. they, they're doing things now. So, Fair enough. I almost wish, I, I agree certainly with the comment that uh, a lot of these aesthetic things are, are better served not by the city uh, because it just doesn't serve us that well, I think. And I think it would alleviate the load some on the code enforcement people, that they can go after things more important than this. Uh, and, I, and I wince any time I see the wording in the, uh, in the city ordinance uh, that's equal to the ACC. And, and Jason, I think the fire has been started already. Yeah, I think the fire was started with white fences. Well, that's and possible. This, and this would be an opportunity for the city, not just this single case, but in, in other uh, ordinances as well, that we might review it and say, you know what, we don't really need to be in that business. The ACC can take that lane. That's my thoughts. John, Jerry, anything? The only problem with ACC is their lack of consistency in, in whatever they do. Arbitrary and capricious, you might say. Yeah. <laughs> but see that they can be and we cannot be I know. and that yeah. you know the citizens that shouldn't be treated that way of course I saw Jason's uh, opinion on the situation and I think it got around to Doug and Doug's already familiar with a, a complaint on the east side involving a, a, a commercial a property zone commercial but yet it's a residence that someone that people are living in and uh, they've got construction equipped with trailers, um, vehicles, 
parked out in front of the residence. Um, my question was, um, which which implies there, if you've got a, a commercial property zone commercial that someone is living in as a residence. What standards are they which, expected? Which, well, which situation applies, the uh, commercial or the residential? So, I mean, uh, are they in violation with these vehicles being parked in front of the residence? Um, did, I re did I read that, a, that um, vehicles have got to be parked uh, behind the location? Well, the, the, the ordinance that we were talking, what I chatted to you about on the email, talks about requirements in residential zones. So if it's a commercially, so we've got to look at the zoning map and see, <laughs> we may have a property that is residentially zoned, or excuse me, that is that is commercially zoned, but, but has a pre-existing house on it that's allowed to continue because it was pre-existing non-conforming. So if it's zoned commercial, then they're not going to be subject to that statute that talks about, or the ordinance that talks about parking locations in residentially zoned lots, because it's not a residentially zoned lot, right. even though someone may be living in it as a residence. So that was the circumstance I talked to you about. Now, I, I would want to look at whatever individual circumstance you had going on that we need to look at the zoning and figure out what they were doing. And, uh, you know, it'd be very fact specific. If that's what code enforcement does, they go out there and look at that stuff. Yeah, there's, there's more than more than one individual is uh, complaining about this particular location, and I don't know if it's if it's because of the people who live there or if it's because of the actual situation. Are they complaining? Are they calling code enforcement? I, I you know, I, 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 people can certainly call their alderman, but man, it would we can get it. If they call the city office where the people are, they're going to enforce and drive out there and look at it. We can get a lot more done. Well, you know. I'll tell you the number one complaint that I that I hear from people is the inability to make contact with someone um, and the community development. And if they leave a message, they do not ever hear anything back from the message they left. Well, I can't speak to that, but if they have an example, I'm sure we'd want to know about it. Can't speak for Doug. Sure. I know if anybody's tried I mean, to call, reach me. I want to know about officers it. that are in the field. Typically from nine to four, and building inspectors as well. They all have voicemails and emails, and I mean, if somebody's not calling you back, let me know, and we'll and people see why. Expect to call within minutes when the whole system. Once you even get started, you're looking at three, four weeks or whatever. People expect it, bing, 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 just get it all done, and they don't understand. It takes time. Well, I realize that if you had someone, if you had a person answering the phone or phone calls come in, it would be impossible probably for one person to answer all those calls that are received in a day's time. Yeah. Um, I'm sure that it just wouldn't happen. But, I mean, from my own personal experience, it's difficult to make contact with anyone in community development because you get one number and just punch this number, and then after you punch that number, and you got to punch another number to go to another number. And, and very seldom have I ever actually made contact with someone. I think maybe I have a couple of times that I've actually made contact with a person whenever I call. It was always, you know, referred from the various numbers and then leave a message. If you call well, the back, city, back to the broader, I'm sorry. Yeah, no, that's where I was going to go. Okay. I was going to say, yeah. Doug, if, if there's next, next time you have the opportunity to talk to the code enforcement, if there are things that they feel like, man, I, wish, I sure wish, it doesn't feel right when I have to go give that notice for sure. this particular case. If there are things like that that you might want us to entertain as far as how we could change the ordinance to be a little friendlier, a little a little more accommodating, then uh, we, can, we can consider those things. This one I understand is, is tricky. Uh, for the fact that where does it stop? This is you know a very nice little example, and I can see why the gentleman thinks why why do I have to you know it, it can be solved if you'll put a gate and a fence in front of it, so it's not the end of the world. But uh, it did it did get me to start thinking: Are there things that our code enforcement people just go, man? I, I sure. wish I'd, we didn't have to mess with that. It saves us time. It's not necessarily the the juice is not worth the squeeze as far as 
the impact that we're going to have by, by making that change. Sure. I, can talk I, to them. I think we'd be interested in hearing about sure. that. Well, we want to change something just to change it because it makes it difficult for somebody. It has to make sense. And I you know we yeah, would Most of their that. circumstances are difficult because it only goes to them because. Yeah. yeah. So just one more comment about, about the boat beside that. So that's a nice, clean example, right? I mean, that's. Well, you're also going to have people parking boats on the side of the house. It's grass. You're going to park them down there. Well, you can't do that. Well, that's, okay. that's in the ordinance. I wouldn't we're propose okay. changing that. Yeah, yeah. It's yeah. got to be at least SB2. Yeah. yeah, at least. Got to, got to be uh, a and border road, road material. That's a good point, though, that sometimes other people, uh, I mean, his department's in a position to notice, gee, this particular law isn't working very well, mm -hmm. more than we are, actually. Mm -hmm. I noticed last time I, when I was at the planning commission, they were talking about, gee, city council maybe really needs to look at changing this or that, because they're in a position to see where maybe something, I think they're talking right. about putting more things in place, commercial, ahead of time, you know, anticipating the future. Yeah, when they get perhaps. variance requests over and over for something, it's yeah, hard to make them think, well, they, maybe, yeah, maybe this that. ought to be a change in the ordinance yeah. rather than they keep coming in for variance. But some of these things that are, a lot of these predate, even when I've been on council, but a lot of these things where we have the exact same law as the uh, ACC, I think the city was trying to actually make it easier on citizens because people were complaining, oh, the city says one thing, ACC says another. So we were thinking, hey, let's let's try to make it more understandable for them. But if, like we follow their that, office next to ours, if we follow yeah. that exclusively, we would have passed an ordinance that says there's no white fences, and we're not going to do that. Yeah. Right? <laughs> okay. I'm not going to propose it. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not we, there are certain, let me, let me just add a leak, so I'm, since I'm here. I might as well make it legal. Uh, there are things that they can do that we cannot do constitutionally. Mm -hmm. Yeah. They can regulate, they do. In fact, we talk about signs. We have got a very comprehensive set of sign regulations. It has to be very particular because we have to abide by the First Amendment. We've got people that are trying to make speech and we, have to, we can't restrict that. We've got First Amendment constitutional issues. The ACC doesn't. I mean, in fact, their rule says if it's a residential part of the city, no signs unless it's real estate. None. No vote for John Doe for governor. No presidential signs, nothing. And they can go and they can enforce that. Now, we can't have that rule. We don't. And we have a very comprehensive set of regulations because there's only so much we can do. But I don't, I don't think that people, a lot of people realize just how powerful they are, to be, believe it or not. And, uh, but they can do a lot. They can be arbitrary. They can be, if it looks right to us, we'll allow it. If it's the right tone of color. We can't adopt those. We, we could never adopt those kind of rules because we have to abide by due process and constitutional standards. So they, <laughs> there is a benefit to a lot of things they can do that people, um, I think, would miss if it didn't, didn't, didn't happen, I guess I would say. If they would just be consistent in mm -hmm. their, their enforcement. All righty. Good conversation. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Doug, for, I just uh, wanted to say... We have two people, sometimes three, that answer that phone during the day. I don't know how many walk-ins come in our office, but if, I would say 10 an hour easily. So if they're helping someone at the desk, of course the phone doesn't get answered and it rolls to voicemail. But I would invite any of you to come sit at the front desk for a day yeah. and see how many times the phone See the activity you actually experience. Walk-ins. We actually um, have an opening at the front desk. We do. <laughs> so there's a seat available. <laughs> you can all take a couple hours a day. We have uh, some circumstances. I, I, we, have, we have great citizenry around here. I'm just going to tell you the truth. We do have some little neighborhood scraps that develop, and people love poking at each other. So they'll call, they'll, oh, I'm just going to call them about their boat. And then, oh, okay, well, I'm going to call them about that dog I saw. And yeah, next thing you know, you're into that. Yeah. Yep. Yep. We had a neighborhood dude that was in the office today that lasted over an hour. Oh, my. Yep. It's a civil issue, but... Mm -hmm. You know, the city gets brought into it, so that takes... Motion to adjourn. <laughs> so we're going to keep doing this for a while. All righty. Good conversation. Thank you. We shall see you next Monday. Emily, again, thank you. You can put a sign on my heart if you want to. You need to put something in the bigger.